I, and I don't know where your category is officially, but since I'm in charge on the platform overseeing right now what's going on, I'm going to create my own age. So if you're 12 to 50, I want all of you to stand. Everybody 12 to 50 stand because that's the youth group. I'm 50, so I always make sure I'm in that group. All right? 12 to 50. What a great crowd. Thank you so much for coming. You may be seated. Thank you so much for being here. And I know God has something special for you. And I think it's really healthy for you to hear from older people. It's really, really healthy. And that's, I didn't mind this at all. I'm not, I wasn't even nervous in the slightest bit. And I, I thank God because, you know, you need to hear what God's done in their lives. And as a church, it would do you good. Maybe you do it. I have no idea. But every once in a while, it's just on purpose. Just hear testimonies from older people on purpose. Let them tell their story. And you might be shocked. You just might be shocked. It'll encourage you because, you know what, they have battles too. And they went through some situations in their life. And they remind us, as I'm going to preach in just a little while, that, that when you look at their life, that failure doesn't have to be final. That's right. Amen. Amen. Failure doesn't have to be final. And that's what we're going to talk to you for just a little while tonight. Psalm, if you brought your Bible, Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 23 is where we're going to begin and just read a couple of verses. Stand with me if you're able tonight in reverence of God's Word. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for the good food. At the Parsonage, we appreciate the food that's sent along with us, all the little variety goodies that you've just provided. You've been such a blessing, and we're trusting the Lord will continue to help us in a very, very special way as we enter into the weekend and the Lord's Day, and we're just going to trust Him to continue to have His way. Psalm 37, verse 23 and 24, says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall." He shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Hallelujah. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. It's good to have one of my heroes. One of my heroes that are in the crowd tonight. And you know him quite well because he graced this platform for many, many years. As well as the one across the, the way. But Brother Barry Arnold, it's so good to see you tonight. Would you pray for us as we endeavor to preach tonight, especially to the young people? Dear Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house tonight. We thank you for everyone that's here and especially the young ones. We pray that you bless the preacher tonight. Yes. The anointing. Oh, God. Amen. 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 Help us, oh God. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. We're living in a world where they have sometimes really misconstrued what is considered successful and what is considered failure. If I was to ask you tonight, is this successful or a failure? Graduated 42nd out of 50 in your class. Especially a military school. This person graduated number 42. I mean, who remembers... 42. Always remember the first, right? Well, most would think, well, I probably wasn't too successful, but Napoleon Bonaparte was an incredible military leader. And he graduated 42nd out of his class of 58. Think about this individual. He set the major league record for strikeouts with over 1,300 times that he struck out and missed the ball. That same player... Um, set a record for five consecutive strikeouts in a World Series. He led the league five times as the strikeout king. That means he missed the ball more than anybody else. But most people wouldn't consider Babe Ruth to be a failure, would they? But that's who it was. In 1894, an English teacher noted on a teenager's report card, a lack of success. The student was Winston Churchill. And most people in that part of the world, and even in our part of the world, haven't considered him a failure. In 1905, at the University of Bern, that, that university turned down a doctoral dissertation as irrelevant and fanciful. The writer of that paper was none other than Albert Einstein. 
This man performed 50,000 experiments that everyone failed. 50,000 experiments that failed. You would assume this famous inventor would have had some serious doubts along the way, but when asked if he ever became discouraged working so long without positive results, the great Thomas Edison replied, Well, I now know 50,000 things that don't work. Success, failure. I'm here to simply remind you tonight that failure is always an event. It's never a person. Failure is always an event. It's never a person. Teddy Roosevelt said the only man who never makes a mistake is the man who never does anything. And ladies and gentlemen and young people, listen to me tonight. Failure doesn't have to be the final chapter in your life. Failure doesn't have to be the final chapter in your life. I mean, here was a man whose business at age 21 crashed. He then ran for a legislative race at age 22, but lost, was defeated. He then worked and he did business for a couple of years, but again he failed. At age 27, he, he lost his sweetheart and had a nervous breakdown. His life was a mess. Seven years later, he ran for Congress and lost. At age 46, he ran for the Senate, lost. He attempted to run for vice president at 47, lost. He again ran for Senate at age 49, lost. And after all those failures, he thought, well, you know, why not? And he runs for the presidency of the United States at age 52, and Abraham Lincoln became the 16th president. Go figure. He understood that failure didn't have to be the final chapter in his life. And he failed over and over and over again. And he became president. I stand before you tonight. And I can recall the, the failures of my life. And I thank God somewhere along the way I learned that failure didn't have to be final. That failure are events that happen in life, but they don't define the person. I mean, I remember the first time I, I failed athletically. You know, I, um, I, I, I love to, loved to play ball. I, I love to play sports. And, and, you know, I had a dream to, to be a professional baseball player. I had a dream to play shortstop for the New York Yankees. That was really my goal. That was my dream. And I've often said, Derek Jeter can thank God I got saved when I did. You may never heard of him. Because that's what I wanted to be, the shortstop for the New York Yankees. And I remember playing a, a baseball from the age of five all the way up through high school, age 16. And, you know, I wasn't a bad ball player. I was pretty decent. And as a kid from St. Petersburg, Florida, who played Little League and played baseball, our dream as a kid was to go to Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Now, I never did. I never got to play there. But that was my dream. And I remember playing Little League as a 12-year-old, and, and I was a pretty decent ball player in those days. I, I, I played shortstop when I wasn't pitching, but I was a pretty decent pitcher at the age of 12 and 11. And, and I remember I, um, I was at a game, and, and you know, we were a pretty good team. It was all-star season. I was on the all-star team, and, and um, you know, I enjoyed playing. And, and I was on the mound. The coach gave me the ball, and, and I knew when he gave me the ball, I was there for all six innings because I started what I finished. And it was long before the day of pitch counts and preparing, protecting the arms of people and all that. You just threw the ball. And I remember standing there on that mound as a 12-year-old, and I was ready to go. We were all juiced up and jacked up and ready to go. And, and I'm on that mound, and I always start off with a fastball right down the middle. I mean, I wanted that batter to know that heat was coming, and I was here. And so I remember standing there on the mound, and, and I digged in, and, and I, 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 I kicked, and I delivered a fastball right down, the, right down the heart of the plate. And can you believe the batter actually got his bat out in time, and he actually hit the ball square, and he hit a shot up the middle right over my head to center field for a base hit. I thought to myself, man, that kid's lucky. I got on the mound again and got the ball, and this time I'm going the old curveball. So I got where I needed to be, and... Shook him off. I didn't want the fastball. I wanted the curveball. And, and so this, I, I mean, I had a pretty good curveball. I mean, I had what they call one of those nose-to-toes kind of curveballs that makes the, the knees of the batter buckle a little bit, kind of coming at him. He buckles back, and it just curves. I mean, it was just a great pitch. 
And I remember I stood on that mound. I was going to throw that curveball. And you, you kind of throw it toward their hip or toward their ribs. And, and that's just what you do. You kind of, you kind of aim it there. And, and they're going to buckle. They're going to get out of the way. And then that ball's going to curve in. Now, Twelve-year-olds, they don't tell you to do that. But back in my day, you just threw the ball. Today, you know, they're real careful. But I remember I stood on that mound. And I threw that nose-to-toes curveball. And I'm not sure what it looked like. I mean, it looked like a good pitch to me, but to the batter, it must have looked like a big old beach ball coming in. As though you couldn't miss it. Because, I mean, he took a hack and just crushed that ball and hit it in the gap. And I mean, I'm like, I'm serious? I've thrown two pitches and, man, they just hit me. Long story short, I mean, they're beating me up. They're hitting everything I'm throwing. We get out of the first inning, but it's the second inning. and It's the same thing. And the next thing I know, we're down something like 8-0. to zero. And it's not even over yet in the second inning. I mean, they're still batting. And I remember the coach said, hey, Blue, time out. And he called time, and he steps out on the field. And I thought, man, what's he doing? Because, he, you see, I, nobody ever came in after me. I always finish what I started. But the coach walked out. I'll never forget, he walks out on the field. And we kind of get together, and he sticks his hand out. He wasn't wanting to shake my hand. He was wanting the ball. And he stuck that hand out. And he said, hey, good try, good effort. He said, hey. So I turned around, and I'm walking to my position because if I didn't pitch, I played shortstop. That's just where I went to when I wasn't pitching. But I remember the coach looking at us. He said, hey, he said, I'll take the ball. Don't worry about it. He said, hey, um, he called whoever was coming in to pitch. Hey, Durkee, I need you at third. And he started, I said, third base? Are you kidding me? I didn't play third. That's the hot corner. I, I was a shortstop. I could move. I, I knew how to play. I was, you know, was kind of like the leader of the team. I kind of knew. Nope, he just put me at third base. Man, I'm just down. I remember him looking at all of us kids. And, you know, we're just 12-year-olds. We think we're, you know, everything to the world. But, you know, we're just 12. He said, now, come on, guys. You act like the game's over. You still have five times, five innings to bat. It's only 7 nothing, 8 nothing." He said, it's not over. Let's play some ball. And I'm standing over there, and I'm kind of dejected, kicking the dirt probably, and heads down. I don't know, maybe one or two batters. I don't know if it was the next batter or the next batter, but one of those guys, he hit a, he hit a, he hit a shot. And he hit it to the hot corner at third, and, you know, just instinctively. I mean, you've you got to react. If you can't react, you don't play third, okay? It's an instinctive spot. And I remember I'm just there doing what I do, and good balance, and all of a sudden the shot hit, and, and I just reacted. I made a quick one-handed scoop, and... Just fired across the diamond and chest high, third inning, third out rather, the inning. And you know, when that kind of happens, you you know, the juices get flowing. You make a good play and we're hitting the gloves. Each, come on, guys, let's hit the ball. Let's hit the ball. And we get up the bat and a guy starts getting on base and hitting. I get up the bat and I hit a big hit in the gap and drove in a couple runs and we're getting a few runs. And to make a long story short, we not only came back, but we won that game. And the coach congratulated us and and wow, what a team effort. And, you know, it, it reminded me of something. It told me something. You see, I had never experienced that kind of failure before. And it taught me a valuable lesson that even in the athletic arenas of life, that failure doesn't have to be final. Really, in the big scheme of things, all of that really doesn't matter a whole lot in the big scheme of life. So you can't hit a ball. So tonight you go to the, the Family Life Center, and I don't know if they're going to play volleyball, but you go to spike the ball and you miss it. And you feel about that high. Or better yet, maybe, you know, you've been like I have before, and, and there were times in my life I wasn't always good, so to speak. And, and I remember, you know, just imagine you're standing along the fence, because they're going to pick up all your friends, they're gonna, and the two best players are usually the, the coaches or the, the, the ones that pick up the captains, you know. And So they get out there, and everybody's lying, and you're like, pick me, I want to be on his team, I want to be on his team. And they start picking. They pick this guy, and they pick this guy, and they pick this guy, and they pick this guy. And you're like, eep, eep, eep. They're picking this guy, and then you know, there's only four of you left. And that's amazing how all of a sudden, they, I don't know if it's like they remember the Bible that says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Because like the next guy that's supposed to pick, he says, you know what? You can have the last four guys. Go ahead. You can have the last four guys, and you're a part of that crowd. You know what they're saying? They don't want you on their team. You're a liability, not an asset. And you feel like a failure. And then you really feel bad when they put seven of you in right field. Because they don't want you anywhere where most of the action is typically going to happen. Because you can't catch, you can't throw, and the ball goes through your legs. And 
you can't judge it, and you know, and you feel like you're a failure. You can't do it like Mr. Athletic, you know, that person, you know who that is, whoever that is, and they always make everything, and, you know, and you feel like a failure, but young people, listen to me. Failure doesn't have to be final. So you can't make the basket. So you, 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 so you, so you, you can't hit the ball like somebody else. You know, in the big scheme of life, it's okay. Failure doesn't have to be your final chapter in your life in the athletic arenas of things. I remember my academic life. Wow. You know, I, I thank God for academics, obviously. <laughs> you know, I'm a part of a, a college and Christian school and you know, we've got 275 students that I get to speak to and talk to and, you know, and just some brilliant minds of our faculty and staff, and it's incredible. But, you know, there was a day in my life where it was challenging. I mean, it was a challenging. I mean, nobody in my family had ever graduated from high school. Mom, dad, nobody. And I'm in high school, and, and it's a struggle. God saves me. I come from a, an unchristian home, a home of wild, wicked living. I get saved, and I'm trying to serve the Lord, and, and, but I, you know, I wasn't good at school, and it was not an easy thing, and God led me to go to a Bible school to graduate from high school, and I was thanking God for that. I, I, I wanted to go to a Christian school, and the Lord led me to Thomasville, Carolina Christian Academy and College, Thomasville, North Carolina, and um, I remember being there as a high school senior, and and um, well, I was a new Christian. I was a raw Christian. There were a lot of things I didn't know about school and didn't understand about discipline. You know, I, I had no discipline, really. And um, it's one good reason why most young people need to go to Bible college. They need to learn discipline in their life. They need to learn how to subject themselves to those that have the rule over them. Because if you can't do that with the people you see, it's not as, you can't do that with God, who you can't always see. You've got to learn that. And I'm in Bible college, and, you know, and I remember the, you know, it's late at night, and knock at my door, come in. It's, you know, it's way after hours. Dean's like, hey, you've got to shut your light out. It's after 11 o'clock. I said, why? He said, because that's the rule. I said, my dad fought in America's wars for freedom. My parents never told me when to go to bed. Wrong thing to say. Wow. And I get in trouble. And, and I, you know, I didn't mean to, but I get in trouble. Of course, I get disciplined. I'm in, I'm in Bible. I'm a senior in high school. And, you know, this fast forward, it's getting toward the end of the year. And I'm actually, I'm actually going to graduate. I'm actually going to be the first one in my family. And I'm really excited. I'm, so, I'm a little proud about it. I'm going to graduate from high school. And, and really, that's a big accomplishment. If you're going to graduate, that's a huge accomplishment. Thank God for it. And here I am as a high school senior, 17 years old, the first one in my family to graduate. But school was not easy. And I knew English was going to be a, be, a, be a close call. How many of you love English? Let me see your hands. How many of you can't stand people that love English? Let me see your hands. My hands there. Oh, these people who think they have to read English all the time and die. I walked into the English class the other day. I, mean, I just, because I walk around. I'm everywhere on campus. I just love to be everywhere and, and kind of make the day go. And, and I walk into a class, you know, with, you know, appropriately, of course, and, and um, they're diagramming sentences. I said, hallelujah. I said, keep doing it. Keep doing it. It'll be a blessing to you. If nothing else, just the discipline of doing it will help you in life. You know, I said, I didn't ever, I haven't diagrammed a sentence since I've been out of college. But, but I, hey, you got to do it because there's the discipline factor. There's a reason why you do a lot of things, okay? And that's another story. But, you know, English. And I knew I was close and they had a meeting with me. And, you know, when they're having meetings with you toward the end of the year, you're really close. And I remember them saying, now listen, we think if you, if you can get this kind of a grade on the test and you get this kind of grade on the last paper, we think you'll, you'll be, you, you know, we figured it up that you'll be able to, to pass English so that therefore you can graduate. Great. And we think, can you do that? I said, yeah, I can do that. All right, we believe you can, and, and um, so we're, we're excited for you. You can send out your graduation announcements to your whoever. And so I, I got some graduation announcements. I sent them to my family, to my pastor, people in the church, because I was going to graduate from high school. And I remember, and I, I wrote the paper, and whatever it was about. I don't even remember you know, how big it was. I don't remember anything about it. 
but I didn't do as well as I needed to. And I thought, man, that test, I gotta, I gotta do well on that test. And whatever the English test was about, I took the test. But I didn't do as well as I needed to. And I remember them calling me into an office. The principal, the English teacher. I sat down and I mean, we're talking, we're, we're, we're a day out from commencement. And they said, we've, we've done everything we could do and we've tried every, but Daniel, you haven't made the grade. And um, you didn't pass your 12th grade English. And you're not gonna be able to graduate tomorrow. You talk about being a failure. I remember the principal turning his phone around, the little rotor dial, rolling phone, and pushed it across the desk. He said, if there's anybody you need to call, as many as you need to call, you're welcome to call them. And it's on the school. Don't worry about it. Just tell anybody you need to tell. They walked out of the office. And you talk about being a failure. Boy, I was on the bottom. I remember getting on the phone. I mean, what do you say? You can't make up a story, you know. Can you imagine I called my mom? Hey, mom. Yeah, graduation tomorrow. I know, I know. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, you don't need to come. Yeah, yeah, they're, they canceled graduation. <laughs> you, what are you, gonna, you can't make up a story. Hey, dad, listen. <laughs> you don't need to come. Hey, they're just going to give us our diplomas. Don't worry about making the journey. It's no problem. You can't lie. Well, you can't make up a story. I mean, corona hadn't happened yet. We can't even use that excuse. Oh, man, if it would have, that would have been a great one. Yep, they canceled commencement. No, I had to tell everybody on the phone. Um, listen, um, I, I failed. I, I failed my English, and um, tomorrow's graduation, and um, I'll, I'll not be participating. And yeah, it's okay. I appreciate it. And dial the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and over and over again, I, I failed. I failed. I failed. You know, and I, and I, I get it, you know, and, I, and I'm an administrator now, obviously, president of the school, and I get it. And, you know, they couldn't participate in the graduation ceremonies, and my dorm room was on the end of the building. They said, you can stay in your room if you want, and I had nowhere to go. I remember watching my classmates walk up the aisle in the tabernacle at Thomasville. The open side windows were open and graduation was happening. I didn't attend. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't. I mean, they would have let me attend, but I couldn't participate. Well, I didn't want to attend. They said, you can stay in your room if you want. I did. I watched my classmates get their diplomas and turn their tassels and throw their caps and all that they did. And I didn't get to do that. And I realized I was, I had failed. I would failed, I would failed English. But you know, I learned, a, I learned a lesson prior to that. When I thought back to that little league game that I told you about as a 12 year old. And how my coach reminded us that, hey, it's not over. That failure doesn't have to be the final chapter in your life. I began to think about that, and of course, talking to the school, they had told me that, hey, you know, we'll offer summer school English for you if you want. We'll have a teacher teach and give you what you need, and you can do summer school English and, and um, you know, pass and get your diploma. And I contemplated that, and I thought, you know, I'll do that. I'll do that. I, I can't let this define me. God, you've done something in my life, but I know I've got to pass 12th grade English and I've got to get a diploma. And so that summer, I, I took summer school English. I have some advice for you, by the way. I have some real advice for you. Ready? You ready for the advice? If you don't like English, pass it the first time. <laughs> That's great advice. Pass it the first time. Oh, uh, my wife, she doesn't know anything about this. I mean... I mean, she was valedictorian in kindergarten, let alone college. 
Another th- piece of advice I would give you, give you is that if you're not valedictorian or salutatorian kind of material, you know, it's okay. If you'll marry one, it'll help you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It helped me. Thank God. I married a valedictorian. I mean, my wife was one of those kind of students, you know, that, you know, I remember dating her at Penview, and we're walking down the hill for lunch, and she's got tears. She's actually crying. And I'm like, you know, I'm trying to be the, as, as you only do on a Bible college campus, I'm trying to be comforting and consoling in the proper distantly way, you know, all that stuff. And, and I said, what's wrong? She goes, that teacher's not fair. What what that teacher do? <laughs> teacher gave me a 99. <laughs> I said, are you serious? I was shouting for 79s. And she's crying over 99s. I mean, totally different arenas. You don't get it. But here I am, summer school, taking summer school English. And you know what happened? I did summer school English. When my friends are doing whatever they're doing, as a 17 or 18 year old, I'm 17, it's a summer, they've all graduated, doing whatever, and I'm taking English. And I'm taking English day after day, doing English, doing English on homework, assignments, and whatever. And it's now the first or second week of August. And they call me into the school, and the principal meets me in the hallway. No graduation parties, no graduation gowns, no cap and tassel to turn, no, no, no big fanfare. But I remember him looking at me with, his, with the diploma in the left hand and his right hand outstretched. And he says, Dan, you passed. Congratulations. You've earned it. And I learned a valuable lesson that failure didn't have to be the final chapter even in my academic life. Young people, so what if you can't make straight A's? Do the best you can. God expects your best. God will help you. I've told students, if I've told it once, I've told it hundreds and hundreds of times across the years. Listen to me. If you'll do all your schoolwork when you're supposed to do it and you turn it in on time, you're not going to fail. Do your work. God will help you. Apply yourself. So if you don't make the dean's list, you don't make the, you know, the, uh, the president's list, you're not the valedictorian, you don't graduate summa cum laude. Some of us graduate thank the laude. Very thankful I graduated. And then I go off to Bible college. And was I a straight A student in Bible college? No. I graduated with a C plus average. Thank God for C plus averages. I graduated. I never made a grade below a C in college. I thank God. I wasn't the valedictorian types that did all their schoolwork for the semester by the end of September. They had nothing to do in October, November, December. Oh, I wanted to be fair. I wanted to spread it out. That paper deserved that last day. But anyhow, oh man. But failure doesn't have to be final. It doesn't have to be final in your academic life. Amen. Amen. Failure is an event. It's not a person. It doesn't have to define you. Oh, I remember in my social life, the failures that would come along my way. Yeah, I remember when I went off to Bible college and, and I, was, I, was, I hadn't seen so many girls in skirts at one place in all my life. I was like, this is unbelievable. This has got to be like heaven on earth. I'm a young man and man, this is going to be awesome. I'm just being, I'm being as honest and transparent as I know how. And, you know, I started surveying the territory and I, I found this young lady and, and um, I began to kind of court her and we began to spend time together and we're dating together. And, and it was incredible. I mean, wow, she actually liked me and I liked her. And we were boyfriend and girlfriend. And we were in love. And uh, we, were, we were together in school, Thomasville, for that year. And by the way, I... I um, and I got my diploma that summer from Thomasville. You know, I actually was going to go to their college, Caroline Christian Academy College. They had a college. I was actually going to go to their college that year. But, but um, after high school, they decided to close the college. I think they were afraid that I was actually going to enroll in their school. They shut it down. It's never been open since. And so where are we going to go to Bible college? And God led us to Penview. Reverend Paul Martin, our Bible college president at the time, he came to Thomasville and offered all the students, you know, that they could transfer credits and whatever, whatever, and, and he would accept us. And, and so her and I went off to Penview together. 
And I'm in school at Penview. I'll never forget the day in school. I don't know, we were in school a couple months. And the dean came up to my room. He's carrying a big old garbage bag and he sits it in my door. He said, oh, this is for you and this is for you. It was a note. It was a note from my girlfriend. One of those Dear Johnny, Dear Susie letters. And she told me how terrible I was and how I was a good for nothing, whatever, and all this stuff, how awful I am. Worst boyfriend ever. She was breaking up with me. And this garbage bag had everything in it that I'd ever given her. She didn't want any remembrance of me. She was like ridden her land of anything about me. And I'm bawling. I mean, I'm hard. I mean, I thought this was, I mean, you know, first girl, I thought for sure this has got to be the one, you know. I mean, I'm 17, right? I mean, wow, 18, wow. And I'm devastated. I'm broken. I'm crying. And my buddies, you know, Job's comforters all around me in the dorm. You know, you can only imagine. And, um, and I'm pulling stuff out of the bag. Teddy bear. It's terrible. Bible. I mean, I pull out a dress. What am I going to do with a size 6 dress? Somebody tell me. I was just blown away. I mean, she literally get, got rid of anything I'd ever bought her. And I was devastated. I'm a college freshman. What do you do? Well, I learned something in school. And that is, you know, there's more fish in the sea, they say. So, go fishing. Right? You go fishing. And so I did. I started fishing again. And I, 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 I saw this girl. She, she, she's from a, 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 an eastern state in the United States, from Florida to Pennsylvania. That's where she is from. i got to remember this is live streamed. I got to remember this. And I remember I thought, man, she's going to be the one for me. Wow, this is going to be awesome. So I asked her if she'd go out on a date, and she said she would. Fantastic. And, you know, we're going to go out on this particular Friday night, right at the beginning of the school year. Fantastic. We're going to go on a date on a Friday night. Man, it's going to be great. We've got to get a chaperone. It's going to be great, great. And I don't know. I think I might have been in choir rehearsal days later. And one of my buddies, I hear him talking, and I go up there and say, did you hear about so-and-so? And yeah, no, yeah, and they called him by his name and said, yeah, he's taking so-and-so out on a date on a Friday night, and it's the same girl I'm taking out. I'm like, are you serious? I said, no, man, listen, she's going out with me on Friday night. I'm just telling you what I heard. Next Friday night, this is a week later, she's going out with him. He said he got a date with her next Friday night. I'm like, what? No, 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 no. I don't think so. Have you seen? Look at him and look at me. <laughs> and I remember I, I, I got permission to talk to her, and so I sat down with her. I mean, we're not even dating yet, but we're going to go out on a date. And I remember sitting, you know, remember at Penview, we used to have the, uh, the, we didn't have a gazebo there. There was an eagle, eagle fountain that sprayed water out the middle. Remember that? Benches. Were, we're sitting out there on those benches, and I'm talking to her, and I'm like, oh, you should, everything's good for Friday night. Oh, yeah, it'd be great. Go on a day, Friday. Sure, it'll be fine. That's ah, good. Because one of my friends told me that, and it was kind of a crazy thing. He told me that that um, uh, so and so was going to be going on a date with you on a Friday night. She goes, "Oh yeah, he is. He asked me out. I told him I was busy this Friday, but I had availability next Friday." <laughs> I said, uh, how, how, "How's that going to work?" <laughs> you know, I didn't. I, and she says, "Well, wait a minute. You don't own me." She goes, you know, I don't think this is going to work at all. We're just going to forget it. And just like that, she dumped me. And we hadn't even got started. And you talk about feeling like a failure socially. I felt like a failure. I thought, this is unbelievable. So now what do you do, you know? Well, you know what they say. There's more fish in the sea. So I baited my hook and I went fishing. This time I didn't throw it into the college pond. I threw it in the high school pond. I thought, I'll try that. I'm in college, and, and, and I saw this blue-eyed girl who can flat-out play the piano and saxophone. And I thought, man, I'd like to get acquainted with her. And 
Her blue eyes. If you've never seen her blue eyes, I mean, they're, 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 they're real. Some people say, hey, you have tint in your, you know, those, your contact lenses to make them that blue. No, they're real. They're real. I mean, they, I mean, when I saw them the first time, I was like, wow. Her name was Michelle Mason. It's kind of neat. I've never preached with her sitting on the platform, me telling this story. It's kind of a neat setting here. <laughs> never done this quite like this. She's front and center here. <laughs> oh, I'm having too much fun. And I remember, you know, we began that, that relationship. And, and it, it was, it's been incredible. And we, we, we dated or courted. I, this is so crazy, I'm, you know, but I call it dorting. It's a combination between dating and courting. I call it the Dirty Dorting Method. I've taught my boys that. So hold on. I'll write a book someday. You'll buy it. I think the title will be interesting enough. People want to buy it. Like, what's he got to say in there? But anyhow, we dated and courted. Most of our time was together with her family. And that's kind of the general principle of that. And there was occasions, occasions, so alone. And, and we began that relationship. And four, five years... And then marriage, and 28, nine years later, here we are. And You know, sometimes you can feel like a failure. You know, you have your eyes set on him. You've got to have him. I mean, he's the only one. You know, and I've been around young people a lot of years, and it's incredible. I've had them walk up to me and say, oh, Brother Turkey, did you see those guys from Virginia? <gasps> They're so hot. I said, they are? <gasps> yeah, did you see them? I'm like... Well, did you take them into the air conditioning? Did you get them a fan? No, not that kind of hot, you know. Oh, yeah, I know. He takes my breath away. I think I'm in love. I'm like, no, it's called asthma. You need an inhaler. I mean, it's serious. I mean, I love having fun with our young people. It's awesome. All these years at youth camp, Hanover, up in Penn Street, GMYC, and, and camps around the country and conventions. I love young people. It's been awesome. You know, you think you got to have him, and then all of a sudden, he breaks your heart because he found somebody else after camp. You thought for sure after youth camp it was a done deal. I mean, you're going to have him forever. I mean, you're only 14, but he's going to be yours forever. And then in today's modern day, you know what happens? All of a sudden, they unfriend you. Boom. You're unfriended. They've changed their profile. I, I don't have Facebook, I'm not against it, but every once in a while I hear about stuff. You know, like, oh yeah, what's your relationship status? And somebody says, they have complicated. I'm like, really? People actually write that? Complicated. It's like, what does that mean? Oh, I pray for the modern youth of our day. Bless their hearts. But I want you to know, even in your social life, failure doesn't have to be final. Amen. God has somebody for you. He's got a perfect plan in your life. For almost everybody on this planet, God wants them to be married. I didn't say everybody, but almost. Most people, God wants together. The Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. I'm so glad he said that. Because it's true. It's so, 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 so true. And young people, God has something. Outside of your choice, let me just stop for a moment. Outside of your choice to serve Jesus Christ, the greatest decision you will ever make will be in your life's companion. Who you marry. And that marriage will open or close doors for you. Especially in ministry. Oh, I could spend the whole night on that topic. But maybe you haven't failed like I have. But maybe you had relationships that haven't been everything they should have been. Maybe, maybe in your social life it's your mom and dad and you. Or maybe... Maybe it's your husband or wife if you're married. Or maybe it's your teacher. Maybe there's another relationship and you feel like you failed and you've blown it. But you know, failure doesn't have to be final, even in your social life. You know, the last thing I mentioned tonight, and that is this. Not only doesn't failure have to be final in your athletic or academic or social life, but most importantly in your spiritual life. Failure doesn't have to be final. Amen. I heard a, we had a powerful chapel service again today. It was incredible. Altar line. We missed the next class. It was just, I mean, most of the next class. God came. It was wonderful today. Altar in the tabernacle from one end to the other. I had Brother Brian Spanger, local pastors. I had local pastors on Fridays come in to preach. And God used them to preach. And we had a wonderful time. But I heard a young person stand up and talk about 
you know, struggling with their devotional life and you know, how they had messed up and failed and whatnot. And, and um, but God encouraged and helped them today. And, but, you know, failure doesn't have to be final in your spiritual life. Oh, thank God. You know, there have been times in your life where you, you got it settled. Maybe it was at youth camp. Maybe it was at, uh, at youth convention. Maybe it, was, maybe it was in a revival meeting right here or a youth weekend or somewhere. And God really helped you. And, and somewhere along the way, something happened. And now you're tempted to think, well, I blew it. I messed up. And you throw in the towel, so to speak. But you don't have to. Because failure doesn't have to be fine, even in your spiritual life. Here I am serving the Lord, a brand new Christian, and, and I'm living for Jesus, and God is helping me. I'm walking with the Lord, but, but I begin to b- battle something in my life, and, and I just wanted God to do something so bad, and I kept saying, oh God, you must do it, you must do it, you must do it. And, and I got to the place where, God, God, if, if you're really real, you'll do it, and if you don't do it, I won't serve you. And I remember saying that. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. I thought, well, I'm not going to serve him. I remember, I remember being home. You've got to realize I'm not in a Christian home. I'm in a wicked home. But my little bedroom, my, my little place that I had at that moment was, was like my oasis. And, you know, I had little, little pictures on my wall, little sayings like, God, make, God don't make no junk. Little boy there. You know, the footprints in the sand. I had that plaque hanging on my wall. I had good Christian music with tapes. I didn't have CDs back then. They had big ones, not the real little ones that you were used to. They had real big CDs. And they'd go round and round. You know what I'm talking about. And I'd have, I'd have that. I had my Bible, and, you know. And, and, um, and I remember going to my room, and I thought, I'm not serving the Lord. I took those plaques off my wall, my tapes, and put them in this box and pushed them under my bed. There. I'm not going to serve the Lord. And you know what? I'm not even going to go up there where I was going to go this weekend. You see, I was going to be going to a wedding in North Carolina that weekend. I told my church the Sunday before that, that um, uh, I wouldn't be at church the next weekend because I was going to North Carolina. Uh, there was going to be a wedding up there that I was invited to, and I was going to attend that wedding. And so the people in North Carolina were expecting me to come to the wedding. And my home church, they were expecting me to stay at my home church. And I thought to myself, you know what? They don't, they don't, they think I'm going to North Carolina. So I called the people in North Carolina and I said, you know what? Something's come up. I'm not going to be able to make the wedding. Oh, no problem. So the people in North Carolina thought I was staying in Florida, which I was. But the people in Florida thought I was staying in North Carolina. And so they weren't going to fool with me on that weekend. I thought, I can do what I want this weekend. I'll never forget it. I remember... Called up my buddy, Scott. And uh, it was on a Friday. And I said, man, what are you doing after work? And he said, I don't know. What are you doing? He was kind of surprised to hear from me. I said, hey. I said, let's, um, let's, what, you want, what about go, let's go to the movies. He said, I thought you didn't go to those things anymore. Ah, don't worry about that. Let's just go anyway. You know, that big whatever it was, and some big blockbuster was happening. And it was in movie theaters all over St. Petersburg, Florida. And, and I'm 16. And you had to be 17 unless you had a parental guardian with you to get in. But I looked old enough. I figured, hey, we'll just go. See, I hadn't gone to the movies anymore. I, God had already spoken to me about that, and so I stopped going to the movies. But I told my buddy Scott, I want to go. And so he picked me up, and we drove to this place to, to go to the movies. And I'll never forget, we, we walked in. Or a lot of people. It was a big blockbuster film of some kind. And I'll never forget, we were in line, and... We got up there to the counter, and you guys, you guys old enough? Oh, sure, I need a ticket, please. How old are you? 17. You have any ID on you? Sure. And I handed it to him. He said, oh, you're only, you're only 16. Are you here with a guardian? Yeah, I'm with him. How old are you? Yeah, he lied. He wasn't old enough either. Oh, you guys can't come in to see this. You, you, you got to bring an adult with you. And we walked out of there, and Man, they're showing this all over the city. Let's go to another place. And we go to that mall and go to that movie theater. And they were checking ID there too. And we went to another one. And long story short, I tried five times to watch that movie. And all five times, they were checking ID. And I got angry with God. See, I knew what was happening. God was being faithful to my soul. 
God was putting up a red flag, a warning flag, saying, you, you don't want to go down that road. And God was being faithful to my soul. And, and I, I knew what was happening. And I was so angry. And I went back home and, and Saturday. And I'm just all day long. And I'm just doing whatever I want to do. And didn't read my Bible. Didn't pray. I just rejected God and did all I wanted to do. And, and, and I remember calling my buddy up. And I said, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? I don't know. I said, well, listen, why don't you pick me up? And let's go to the town. Let's, I, I, need to, let's go buy, I, want, I need to go buy a pair of shorts. And let's go to the beach. He said, man, what's wrong with you? I thought you went to church. I said, oh, don't ask me. Wait, let's just do it. See, God had already dealt with me about putting pants on. You know, God had already showed me that he didn't want me to wear shorts in public. And so I didn't have any shorts. And my church is not expecting me on Sunday, right? They're thinking I'm in North Carolina. So nobody knows that I can do what I want. Man, I'm failing fast. So my buddy Scott, Sunday morning, he's going to pick me up. If we're going to go to the store and we're going to go to the beach, we're just going to live it up. And I remember the phone rang at the house. I thought it was my buddy Scott. So I grabbed the phone, I picked it up. And, Hello? That was my pastor. I thought, what in the world? See, my pastor, Reverend John Rossman, he was a missionary to Lesotho, Africa. And God led him and his wife, May Rossman, to pastor our church in St. Petersburg, Florida. He was my pastor. And um, I remember Brother Rossman telling me the story that, that um, he was going out into the van, the church van. It was a blue van. He was going out to the van to get in it to go pick up the kids for Sunday school. And as he was just about getting in the van, his wife stepped out, in the, out, of, out of the house right there at the door and said, John... And he stopped and looked back and she goes, don't you think you ought to call Daniel? Oh, May, he's in North Carolina, remember? He, had, he went to that wedding this weekend. I know that's what he said, but something inside says, you better call just to make sure. Young people, God's faithful. He's so faithful. And I remember... Brother Ross has been telling me the story that he walked back into the house. This is before cell phones, of course. He walked back into the house, made the phone call, and now I'm on the phone. Hello? Daniel. Daniel, this is Pastor Rossman. You're home. Yes, I'm home. So you, you didn't go to the wedding for the, the North Carolina this weekend, is that right? No, no, I didn't. Oh, okay. Um, I, um, um, do you, do you, you need me to come down and get you? Oh, no, Brother Rossman, you won't need to. Oh, oh, are you driving? Well, he was a good pastor. Oh, no, no, I'm not driving. Well, how, how are you getting to church this morning? He's a good pastor. Well, Brother Rossman, I, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. Oh, what? So, Brother Rossman, I, I've blown. I, I've messed up, Brother Rossman. I, I've done so many things this weekend, and... God won't take me back. I've blown it. I mean, I've failed so many times. Oh, no, 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 Daniel, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen, listen, God loves you. And you've not gone too far. Let me come get you and let's talk about it. And I don't know what it was, but something said to Brother Rossman, oh, okay. Okay, sure. A little while later, the van pulls into where I was living and I get in. Sit right up front with the pastor. And we have about a 20, 25 minute ride back to the church. And I begin to tell Brother Rossman everything. Things I wouldn't even dream of telling you tonight. I went on that whole weekend. I said, oh, Brother Rossman, I've, I've failed. I've so messed up. He said, oh, Daniel, listen, there's always a way back. God's a God of love and mercy. In other words, failure doesn't have to be fine. Leave it in your spiritual life. He'll forgive you if you'll ask him to. And we pulled into the church. And he had to understand my little church in St. Petersburg, Florida. They were such an outgoing, kind of a boisterous kind of crowd. Everybody that walked through the door, they'd shake your hand and say, Good morning, do you have the victory? It didn't matter if you were the evangelist. It didn't matter if you were the pastor. And I knew what they were going to ask me. And so I kind of tried to avoid that. And, 
You know, there's a crowd of people going in, and I just got around and I sat down in the sanctuary where everybody met for Sunday school, preliminaries. And it was time to sing, and people sang, and I, I was never a good singer. It's off key, but when I would sing, I'd sing out loud, and it was kind of an embarrassment to the people. You know, especially my friends, because I, I couldn't carry a tune, but, but I love the Lord. And so they would hear me sing off key, right? But that morning, I didn't, I didn't say a peep. I mean, I just kind of mumbled. That was so different. And I could sense people looking at me. Conviction. I remember the Sunday school superintendent said, all right, let's, let's pray for the Sunday school and the church service this morning. Let's all kneel. I'm going to ask one of our teenagers, Daniel Durkee, would you lead us in prayer? I was in no shape to pray. We got on our knees and I mumbled through whatever I mumbled through. I'm a failure. I mean, God. And I remember. They dismissed them. Sent us off to our Sunday school classes. and I get out of the vestibule and there, there was my pastor and there was my Sunday school teacher. Conviction weighed so heavy on my heart. I thought, is there really hope? And I got to the end of myself and I looked at my pastor and said, Pastor, do you mean every, do you really believe everything you said? Do you mean that? Will God take me back? Will he truly forgive me? He said, oh, Daniel, if you'll confess, God will forgive you. He'll come into your heart. He'll change your life. I said, Pastor, I need to pray. He said, you want to pray now? I need to pray now. Well, let's go. And I remember we came in the vestib- from the vestibule into the sanctuary and walking up the aisle. And they're starting the adult class. And I said, so, folks, I'm so sorry. I said, but I got to pray. I got to get back to God. And that was, you know, one of the, perhaps one of the only times in that adult Sunday school class that a teenage boy made his way back to an altar and confessed his sins. And you know what Jesus did? He forgave me. He took me back. Even though I was a failure, even though I was messed up, even though I was seemingly lost and hopeless, He took me back. The Bible says, Though He fall, He shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth Him with His hand. And Oh, I thank God He did that for me. My life would have been completely different if I wouldn't have had those moments in my life. The faithful Holy Spirit who prevented me from going to see those movies or prevented me from, from, from uh, wearing things that wouldn't please God and prevented me from desecrating God's day because a little pastor's wife was faithful to heed the, the voice of God in her life. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. As we stand together this evening, I've done my best to unburden my heart. And just to remind our young people, especially tonight, that failure doesn't have to be final. Oh, thank God, He'll take you back. He'll forgive you. You can begin a new walk with Him this very moment. I mean, you look at the life of Peter, and wow, did he ever mess up. Oh, but thank God Jesus looked. And that look of love after the cock crew three times, and Peter denied Christ. And all the Bible says Peter went out and he wept bitterly and he came back to his senses and came to know Jesus again. And maybe there's a person here this evening, maybe a young person, maybe a, maybe a, a young couple, I don't know who you are. Maybe there's a mom or dad that, that God has been speaking to and you've messed up and you have failed. I want you to know there's a way back. God will forgive you. Failure doesn't have to be the final chapter in your life. As we bow our heads tonight and this altar is open, I just wonder if God's speaking. Somebody needs to pray. Somebody needs to pray. You need to ask God to help you. You've been feeling like a failure. Oh, it's not been going well at school. It's not been going well at home. It's not been going well on the job. It seems like everything you touch is is not certainly turning to gold. And and you seem like you've messed up. And the enemy has said, you have failed. You're a failure. You can't amount to anything. You'll never be on the who's who. But all I want you to know, God loves you. And there's grace to restore you and to meet the need of your heart. He loves you tonight. We heard testimonies from adults in the early part of the service of how God helped them and met the need of their heart. And He could do the same for you. Somebody else want to come and join this young lady who's come to pray? Amen. God's here. He wants to touch your heart tonight. Amen. Anybody want to pray? Come and kneel to this altar. God will help you. God will meet your need. Young or old, it doesn't matter. Just come and kneel at this altar. God will help you. He'll forgive you. He knows your heart. He knows your life. Thank God failure is not final. Thank God another has come. Amen. How about it, friend? 
God loves you tonight. He wants to save you. He wants to change your life. He wants to give you hope. Oh, tonight, let God have His way. Is there somebody else tonight you just need to pray? The devil's been beating you up and he's been having a heyday in your life. But tonight, tonight, to defeat the enemy of your soul, and let God pick you up and let God change your life. Failure doesn't have to be final. Thank God tonight. Thank God tonight.